If you have a Bible with you, you might want to turn to the 26th chapter of Matthew. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 31. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 31, we'll get to in a few minutes. I'm going to start with a couple of stories that are not pleasant stories to tell, nor are they pleasant stories to hear. I only do it because of what I want to talk about in just a few minutes, so please don't be offended by them. One had to do with a fellow that I met a few years ago. He was telling me about his church where he went to church. I, it was at something like the Tulsa Workshop or Nashville Jubilee or something. I remember, don't remember exactly where we were talking. He said that he had been a leader in his church and that he had sinned in a very egregious and public way. That everybody in the community knew about it because it was a small community and of course it had hurt the church as well as hurting his family and etc. He said that he had done everything he could to make it right. He had gone before the church, confessed his sin. He and his wife had worked out their problems and solved that. And he continued to go to church there, but he was told, he was told, you need to sit on the back row and keep your mouth shut because everybody knows what you did. A couple of years had transpired, and on one particular Sunday, he came to church, and much like we do here, they have a tradition in their church that somebody stands at the back door and hands out the church bulletin. On that particular Sunday, he noticed that nobody was doing that. And so he grabbed a handful of bulletins and stood at the back door and was handing them out. When a church leader approached him and said, you're not allowed to do that. You're supposed to sit on the back row and keep your mouth shut. Go do that, which is what he did. He said, I'm told I can't usher. I can't do anything ever again, ever again in that church is what he said. The second story has to do with a young lady that I knew when she was a teenager. She was raised in a very good Christian home. I know her parents. Uh, I knew her, well, as I said, when she was a teenager. She, she grew up. She went to one of our Christian universities. She found a young man there and married, and they did very well for a while. As a matter of fact, I remember visiting with them while they were engaged. I had a, a meal with them when I was speaking over at their university. And I remember telling him, because I knew her and loved her, I said, my brother's on a paving company. And if you mistreat her, we will put you in a parking lot. Somewhere along the course of their marriage, she strayed. She committed adultery. It ended her marriage. Not too long after that, she married the man that she had been unfaithful with. And they, after a while, had a child. She decided that she needed to make her life right. She needed to go back to church. And so she went to a church in the town where they lived. And this was a relatively large town. And she went to a church, and she went and met with the church eldership, she and her husband, and said, what we did was simple. It was wrong. There was no way to justify it. At the same time, we don't know how to go undo it. What's done is done. We have asked God to forgive us. We are now asking if this church would accept us. Can we come here? They deliberated for a while before they gave her their decision, which was, yes, you can come, but you cannot place membership. And... You cannot have a church directory. I'm not quite sure how that tied into things, but they were not allowed to have a church directory. Her child was about three at the time, and, and she took him up to a, one of her programs, much like we have here for the children's program. She said there was an older man in that church that all the children loved because he carried gum and candy in his pockets and always gave it to the kids, and all the kids flocked to this guy. And so on one occasion, she walked in, and her three-year-old knew that fella had candy, and she rushed over to him, and he picked her up and tossed her in the air like he did with all the kids when one of the sisters said, put that child down. Do you not know who she is? And he put the little girl down and backed away and wouldn't touch her again because the mother had earlier committed adultery. And so... That's the way they, they dealt with that church. Now, let me go to the third story, which is changing gears altogether. This one happened just last week. I was speaking over, uh, well, I guess I'll leave out where I was speaking to make sure I give anonymity here. A man approached me and he said, I used to be a minister. I had an affair some years ago. Of course, it cost me my ministry. My wife and I were able to work it out over time. I now work here, the place where I was speaking the other day. He said, but I feel a calling of God on my heart that I'm supposed to go back into ministry in some fashion. It's been several years since my sin. It's been several years since we've worked everything out. Do you, do you believe that God could use me again? 
Now, the answer to that question is without a doubt, God can use you again. But there are a couple of caveats there. One would be, if God chooses you to use you again, then you would also have to be part of a church that would allow God to use you again. And those things don't always go together. That's why I told you the first two stories. You say, how do you know that God would use them again? Well, that's where my story begins here in the Bible. Matthew 26, beginning of verse 31. Jesus is telling his disciples what's about to happen to him. He's about to go to the garden. He's about to be betrayed. He is about to be crucified. Then Jesus told them this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Now, these are his closest friends he's talking to. And he's telling them, tonight when, when I'm going to be betrayed, all of you are going to betray me. Now, that all is generic because actually one of them will not. But it's a generic all. Typically, most of you, I guess, is the way we would say it in our day and time. And the next verse says, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Now, he's telling them, I'm going to rise from the dead. They're not completely understanding it, but that's what he's saying. In the next verse, it says, Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Now, this is the apostle Peter. He loves Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus loves him. If you read about his interaction with the apostles, you'll find that there were three apostles he spent more time with than the other. Peter was one of those three. The other two were brothers by the name of James and John. And Peter's saying, I'm never going to do that. Look at the next verse. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Now, when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, doesn't mean he was lying otherwise. When he says that, that's his way of putting an exclamation point behind something. When I say it like that, I tell you the truth, boom, you underline it, you see it. He said, I tell you the truth, this very night before the rooster crows, you, talking to Peter, will disown me three times. Next verse. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. All of them said it. But it's significant that he pointed out that Peter said it. No matter what happens, I'm never going to leave you. I am never going to abandon you. Now, you might be looking at that and saying, well, it's not an oath. He didn't swear it. But you might remember back in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, look, sometimes people make oaths and they think that what they make the oath by makes it more binding. Like, ah, I make this oath by heaven. I make this oath by the temple. Or I make this oath, whatever. He said, no, no, no. Here's the way it should be with you. That whatever you say should be the way it is. And so your yes should mean yes. And your no should mean no. In other words, you don't have to swear. You don't have to take an oath. When you say something, it counts. It means something to me. And so when Jesus said, or when Peter said, even if everybody else falls, not me, even if I have to die, I will be with you. Hmm. Let's go over to, it's about verse 60, let me see, I'll find it here. Verse 69, same chapter. Verse 69 in the same chapter. Now, what transpires between this verse and verse 69 is that Jesus goes to the garden he prays. He asks God to take this cup from him if there's any other way. Judas comes and betrays him. Peter, Peter actually tries to stand up for Jesus. He pulls out a sword and he goes at some guy. And, and when he goes at Malchus, this fellow, he cuts his ear off. Now, you understand that, that as a fisherman, he was not a finessed swordsman. And therefore, if he cut some guy's ear off, it wasn't like, I got your ear. If he cut some guy's ear off, it means he was going to split his head in two. And he just missed. You do recall what Jesus did. Jesus, Jesus said, if we were of this world, we would fight. But it's not of this world. And Jesus reaches down and picks up that ear and puts it back on and heals it. Peter's got to be thinking, Lord, if you're going to keep healing them, this is going to be a long war. Now Peter doesn't know what to do. Because he's ready to fight for Jesus. He's ready to die for Jesus. But Jesus has acquiesced to the arrest. And Jesus has basically chastised Peter for what he just did. And now, and now Peter runs away. All that bravado, all that I'll be with you, even if I die with you, all goes away when things aren't going the way he expected them to. They're not going the way that he wanted them to. And he runs away. 
Now, later he comes down to where Jesus has been arrested. John is already there. John actually gets Peter inside so that Peter is nearby where this is happening. Now, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you're one of them for your accent gives you away. Here's what that means. The apostles are from a section where people talked a little differently. As Americans, we understand that. Sometimes you can talk to somebody and you can tell, oh, you're from the South or you're from the West or you're from the Northeast just by the accents. Uh, we're talking to a fellow just the other day, they were talking about where he should park his car. And I said, where in the Northeast are you from? And he told me, he said, how did you know? And I said, because they stole your R's. So with an accent, with an accent that made it clear that he was one of those who had been with Jesus, they said, surely, uh, back up one second, fellas, surely you're one of them for your accent gives you away. Now the next verse, thank you. Then he began to call down curses on himself and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. Now you recall that Jesus had told him, yeah, you said you'd die with me. You said you wouldn't run away, but I'm telling you that before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And he did. Jesus knew it was coming. Jesus knew what was going to happen. Now, Luke gives a little different picture of this. In the Gospel of Luke, it says that when that rooster crowed, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Peter had eye contact. Can you imagine how that must have felt? I've let people down before. I've done things that have, that have caused great pain and harm and hurt to people. Somehow it seems it's a little easier to do when you don't have to look them in the eye. But imagine doing that. And after that rooster crows, Jesus turns and looks at him, makes eye contact. And you can imagine, you can imagine all the emotions that are flooding through Peter. Look at everything he's experienced that night emotionally. Jesus said, they're going to take me away. Peter has already told Jesus beforehand, I don't want that to happen. You may remember on one occasion when Jesus started telling them he was going to Jerusalem, he was going to die. Peter said, you can't do it. On that occasion, you remember how Jesus chastised him? He said, get behind me, Satan. Not that Peter was Satan, but by that encouragement, he was actually working on the devil's side. So he's already been chastised by this. And now when you get closer to the time and Jesus says it's going to happen and you all will fall away from me. And Peter says, no, not me. Even if I have to die, I'm never going to leave you. And so when they come to get Jesus, oh, we skipped one part. When Jesus is in the garden and he's praying, he leaves Peter and James and John. He goes a little ways away to pray and he comes back and they're asleep and he wakes them up and he's frustrated because they won't stay awake to pray with him. But they're fishermen. These are guys that are used to going to bed at dark and getting up before daylight. It's not that they don't care. It's just the way they're conditioned. He goes off and prays again, and he comes back, and he's frustrated again that they have fallen asleep. They know he is in great agony, and even then they have fallen asleep. And so he's chastised again. Jesus said, I know your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. And then when they come, and there's Judas heading the crew. And he walks over and he gives Jesus that betrayal kiss. And Peter is now infuriated. He's said, I'll die with you. 
he's now been chastised, said, you're going to deny me. He's been chastised again because he falls asleep. And now he sees what Judas is doing. And in his great anger, he grabs a sword and he tries to cut that head's dude in two. And Jesus chastises him again. And now he's so confused. He doesn't know what else to do. And he runs away. Did he know better? Yes. Was he wrong? Yes. But if I were to poll this audience with everyone here who, who is old enough to have some comprehension of, of their lives and ask you, have you ever known better? Have you ever known that what you were about to do was wrong, but you did it? And some of us would try to justify it by saying, but I was caught up in the heat of the moment. I mean, I mean, Peter could have said that I, all this stuff had just happened. And, 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 and when he stopped me from fighting, my emotions just took over and I ran. Okay, sometimes you sin like that. Sometimes you sin just because on the spur of the moment you lose control of yourself. But this is now later. He's getting close to daylight and he's come in there and he sees what they're doing to Jesus and it's got to be going through his brain I told him I would die with him and the first time somebody says you with him no how do you think he felt what do you think's rushing through that brain of his? The second time, you've got to be with him. This time he called down an oath. Basically, he's cussing, as we would say it in our culture. The third time, we know, and now he starts cursing himself. I'm a blankety blank blank. May God blank 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 this to me. Where do you think that's coming from? Here's a man who's lived with Jesus for three years. Look at the way he's talking. Does he know better? Yes. Can I, he blame it on an impulsive spur of the moment action? No. The emotions are still involved. But now it's a whole lot more about what Peter wants for himself than what it is that Jesus wants from Peter. Is it a sin? Absolutely. You know, sometimes people want to categorize sins. You know, this sin's worse than this sin. That sin's worse than that sin. In one sense, that's true. Particularly in the eyes of the world. For example, if you get convicted of first-degree murder, the consequence is going to be significantly more than if you get convicted for theft. You do understand that consequences can come about based on sin, particularly in, in the worldview and the consequences, the things that we reap that we have sown. But when we come to looking at sinning against God, can we really say that one's worse than another? Yet, yet churches tend to do that. When, when I was a young man, I recall going to some lectureship somewhere, and they invited a fellow to speak, and they, were, they introduced him as the meanest man in Texas. That's a lot of people. If you're the meanest man in Texas, you're pretty mean. And, and then they explained why he was the meanest man in Texas. As a matter of fact, he'd written a book. I bought the book, one of the few books I actually read like that. The man had been convicted of murder, had gone to prison. In prison, he killed a prison guard. And altogether, he had killed seven people. He had him in solitary confinement because they didn't want him killing any more prison guards. He didn't even have a light in there. He asked for a book, they gave him a Bible. Can't have a hardback book, only a softback book when you're in penitentiary. And because he had no light, he would wait for the, the light to come through that one little shaft of a window, and he would move all day long just reading his Bible. And in that process, learned about God, learned about repentance, learned about the love of God. He actually had, he became a Christian based on his own reading. And somehow, through a bizarre set of circumstances, after he had become a Christian, converted to, to, to Christianity, then he actually had gotten out of prison. I don't know how, but he did. And now he was going around the country lecturing about the great mercy of God. And I recall sitting there and the guy next to me looked at me and said, 
It's just not an amazing story of grace and mercy and forgiveness that a seven-time murderer can stand in the pulpit and preach about God's mercy. I said, yes, it is. I was young and often in trouble because sometimes I just spoke before I knew what I was saying. Any of you ever have that problem? I said, I'm glad it was murder because if he had been married seven times, we'd never let him in our pulpit. Am I right? Now, the person next to me was highly offended. Sin is sin. But I can't think of any greater sin than to deny Jesus. And then to have him look at you. And you know what the Bible says he did when Jesus looked at him? He wept bitterly. Anybody ever been that sorry for what you've done? That convicted of your own sinfulness? That you wept bitterly? I have. When you have to come face to face with your sin and see what you have done how it's affected other people the consequences not just in your life but the consequences of people around you weeping bitterly indicates what's really in Peter's heart you see he did love Jesus he really did But that love was not strong enough on that occasion. Now you might be thinking, but at least he didn't commit adultery or at least he didn't commit murder. Right, we'll go to the Old Testament for those stories. King David, who did both adultery and murder, and yet it was after all that, after his penitence, after he made himself right with God, it was after all that that God would write of him he is a man after my own heart. Is that correct? So what about Peter? Let's move over to 21st chapter of John. I think it's around verse 15. They're looking for it back there. I didn't give them the passage, and so they're writing. Okay, where's Joe headed now? John 21, I think it's about verse 15. Ah, yes. Jesus has appeared to the disciples twice already. By the way, if you were Peter, when they buried Jesus, do you think you might have been feeling something like, if only he were still alive, I could tell him how ashamed I am of what I did. If only he were still alive, I would tell him that I'm so sorry that I let him down. If only he were still alive, somehow I could make this right. Do you think maybe Peter might have felt those kinds of things when they buried Jesus? And then he comes back to life. On the third day, he resurrects from the dead. Peter and John run when they're told that the tomb is empty. They see it. It really is. He's resurrected. And then, and then he shows up to meet the disciples. If I were Peter, I don't know what Peter felt. I'm just thinking about what I would feel if I were Peter. If I were Peter, the first time Jesus showed up after his resurrection, as much as I would have wanted for him to still be alive so I could tell him how sorry I was, I'd be terrified to meet him when I found out he was. Because the last time he looked at me, the last time we'd made eye contact, I saw his pain. I saw his hurt. I saw his disappointment. And now that I know he's alive again, if it were I, I'd be terrified of what I was going to see in his eyes. Would it still be disappointment, 
hurt, pain. Now this is the third time. So Jesus has already made it clear to Peter through this interaction with him that I've forgiven you. On this occasion, Peter's gone back to fishing. Some of the other disciples went fishing with him. A man's on the bank and he yells out for them to put their nets out. They fished all night. They haven't caught anything. They put their nets out. They catch 153 huge fish. They expect the net to break, but it doesn't because there's a miracle going on. John, John's the one who realizes who the guy on the bank is. It's the Lord. When Peter realizes it's Jesus, he puts more clothes on. He doesn't start fishing. He's taking some of his clothes off. He puts more clothes on because that's what you do when you approach royalty. You don't come at them naked. And he jumps in the water and he swims to the ship. And Jesus said, let's have some fish. So he goes back to the ship and he gets the fish and they cook and they eat. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Now, there's all kinds of speculation as to what he means when he says these. Looks to me like he's talking about the fish. Peter's been a fisherman most of his life. Now that Jesus has died and resurrected, he's not out preaching the gospel. He's gone back to fishing. It's what he knows how to do. It's where his comfort zone is. And, and fishing is just good for you, in my opinion. So here is out there fishing. You love me more than these. Now, interestingly, there's a little play in, in, in the Greek language here that doesn't appear in the English, but I think it's significant. When he says, do you truly love me more than these? He uses the Greek word agape. Do you agape me more than these? Now, agape is kind of an overarching word. It means, it means doing what's right. For example, in Matthew chapter 5, it's where Jesus said, love your enemies. He said, agape, it's a decision to do what you should do. It's not always a good emotion. You understand? Do you agape me? Are you willing to put me above everything else? Do you agape me? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Now, the word he uses for love is the Greek word phileo, which has to do with strong emotion, a deep and abiding friendship a connection between two people that's very deep. And so he says, do you agape me? And he said, I phileo you. Now, Peter may have been thinking, I'm using the better word here because you're asking me if I'll do what's right, and I'm telling you, I really do love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Next verse. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Again, agape. He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Again, phileo, you know how much I care about you. You know I love you deeply. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Next verse. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Interestingly, now Jesus has changed over to phileo. He's not saying agape anymore. He's saying, do you really care about me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Why did it hurt his feelings? If it were I, I can't speak for Peter, but if I'd have been Joe. I told him before how much I loved him. I told him that I would die with him. And I called down curses on myself and abandoned him, which in my heart has to make me wonder if Jesus knows that I love him because obviously what I did was not demonstrating love at all. Oh, maybe love for me, but not love for him. Now I've been able to interact with him a couple of times after his resurrection and I think, okay, we're all right, we're at peace. He, he's forgiven me, everything's okay. And right in the middle of that, after you think everything's all right, do you love me? You know I do. Do you really? You know I do. You love me? If it were I, I'd be thinking, he's back in that garden. He's looking at me and saying, I know you say you love me, but I know how you acted. I know you say you love me, but I know what you did. 
If I were Peter, that's what I'd be feeling, and that's why it would hurt me. It's like, Lord, I can't, I can't undo what I did. I can't change it. But I love you. I really do. And what did Jesus tell him? Son, stop fishing and start preaching. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. What did he do? He called him back into ministry. Because he knew it hard. Some good people do some really stupid things. Things they know better than to do. Things that if Jesus walked into the room and made eye contact with them would break them. Sometimes they do it for a day. Sometimes they do it for a month. Sometimes they do it for a year. Sometimes they do it for a decade. It's wrong. It is absolutely wrong. It shouldn't happen. Sin is sin. But how does God react to those who do love him? when they put themselves back in his hand. There may be some significance to the fact that he made Peter say it three times because Peter had denied him three times. There may be some significance there. But the real story here is, I know you love me. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. I'm calling you back in the ministry Go do it. Alice and I were divorced in 1984. We remarried in 1987. It was all my fault. We put our marriage back together a couple of years after that. A, a, a guy named Clay Humphreys called me. He said, we want you to come speak at a thing at our church. And I said, you, you of all people should know I can't do that. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I've done? Don't you know where I've been? He made a most interesting comment. He said, now, I always thought that you had a gift of preaching that God had given you. Has anybody else told you that God gave you the gift of preaching? I said, well, the others have told me that. He said, now, if that's true, who does that gift belong to? <coughs> oh, God. Well, if it belongs to him, what right do you have to refuse to use it? So I agreed to go. A few years later, I'm sitting with a friend of mine named Jeff King. Jeff spoke here a few Sundays ago. Remember Jeff? Jeff had gone through some terrible things. We're sitting at a Red Lobster in Augusta, Georgia. He said, I've done terrible things. My life is over. I sin. God will never use me again. And I said, it's amazing that you have decided to put yourself in a position to make God's decisions. If God chooses to use you again, what right do you have to deny him? So Jeff allowed himself to be used again, and God has used him powerfully. Does that mean that God is happy with what I did in 1984? Absolutely not. Does it mean that God is happy with what Jeff did? Absolutely not. But does it mean that God not only will forgive but restore? Absolutely so. Everybody God uses as a forgiven sinner. Everybody. Oh, second part of the question, I've got to answer that, was, yes, God will use you again. He'll call you back to ministry if your heart is good. But you've got to have a church that will let you do that. I can't make the decision for that church where they wouldn't let the guy hand out the church bulletins. I can't make the decision for the church where they wouldn't let her have her church directory. I can't even make that decision for this church. I'm a member. I'm a part of this church, but I can't make that decision for this church. You know who makes that decision? Us. All of us. When God calls people to ministry, are we going to try to look back at what they have been or what they have done or where they are and where they're headed? 
And if God chooses to use them, how dare any human being get in the way of that? You say, you're prejudiced. I am. I'm very prejudiced because I know the grace and mercy God has given me. Can we give it to anybody else?